Back when the internet was young and facts still had meaning, there was the History Channel featuring shows about, you guessed it, history. But that version of the network is long gone today. Here are the biggest scandals to hit the reality TV outlet that's now simply called History. In late 2012 and early 2013, the History Channel aired a single eight-episode season of a reality show called Bamazon. A high-concept treasure hunting show, Bamazon plucked eight construction workers who couldn't find employment in their home state of Alabama, dropped them into the rainforest of South America, and instructed them to run a gold mining project. The show came and went with little fanfare, but one of the real-life construction workers at the heart of Bamazon made headlines three years later when he was arrested for his suspected role in the death of an acquaintance. Early one morning in Tallapoosa County, Alabama, 40-year-old Norman Dion Creighton was shot to death. His body was discovered by hunters in a forested area. The local sheriff's office apprehended 33-year-old Bamazon star Matthew Clayt McDaniel, who had been seen playing pool at a bar with Creighton the previous evening. In June 2018, a jury convicted McDaniel of murder. In 1997, the History Channel aired an hour-long holiday special called Christmas Unwrapped, The History of Christmas. Later released on DVD, the special sought to educate viewers on the origins of numerous Christmas traditions and how observances of the holiday have evolved over time. According to Christmas Unwrapped, Christmas was deemed such an unimportant holiday during the early years of the United States that lawmakers met on that day for decades, business as usual. The United States Congress sat in session and continued to stay open on Christmas Day for most of the next 67 years. That fun fact isn't really true at all, however. PolitiFact investigated and found that the U.S. Senate met for a moment on Christmas Day in 1797 and the House for a spell on December 25, 1802. Other than those two instances, Congress did not meet on Christmas Day during the time period in question. However, this false fact circulated and was repeated by numerous organizations and major news outlets, including Fox News, the ACLU, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart in 2011. After PolitiFact exposed the truth, Stewart had to apologize on air and accept that site's truthometer rating of pants on fire. American Pickers is one of the most popular shows to ever air on the History Channel, and it made reality TV stars out of its Pickers as well as its third full-time cast member, Danielle Colby. She watched over the vintage trading business affairs while the other cast members were on the road, and she also started her own companies buying and selling old valuables, a Chicago store called Four Miles to Memphis, and a bustling Etsy shop online. However, it would seem that Colby failed to pay her taxes on her earnings. In November 2013, assessors issued Colby a lien of $5,978.40, the amount she owed on retail sales tax, a guess by the government on account of how she'd not filed a return for the year in question. Two months later, tax assessors issued Colby another lien in the amount of $5,957.20. And then a few months after that, Colby received another lien for $5,936 in unpaid taxes on retail sales. In 2015, the History Channel aired the miniseries Texas Rising. With a cast including Bill Paxton, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and Thomas Jane, it was a high-profile narrative dramatic series about the creation of the Texas Rangers law enforcement operation. Unfortunately, according to historians, Texas Rising was rife with errors and inaccuracies. The program even gets a major date wrong. A Chiron dates the moment when General Santa Ana rides a horse through the destroyed Alamo as March 7, 1836. In reality, the Alamo uprising ended the day prior. In response to historians and journalists pointing out the flaws in Texas Rising, the History Channel released a statement. As historical fiction, it is designed to ignite interest, to inspire people to learn more about the past, to entertain, and to encourage them to form their own opinions. In May 2011, SEAL Team 6 located and executed Al-Qaeda terrorist group leader and 9-11 attacks mastermind Osama bin Laden. Because the individual identities of the members would be of great interest to the United States enemies, security and secrecy is of extreme importance and a program that aired on the History Channel managed to violate all that. In 2017, the channel aired Navy SEALs, America's Secret Warriors. In a segment about the unit's origins, producers introduced a 1980s-era photo of the 76 original members of the SEALs. No faces were obscured. A one-time SEAL told Page Six, Why would they show that picture? I already am hearing from people who recognized me. Not cool. When reached for comment, a spokesperson at the History Channel said nothing was amiss because that photo had been passed around the internet for years. Ice Road Truckers is one of history's best-known reality shows, depicting the perilous lives of drivers in the iciest regions of Canada and Alaska. And sure, it's been criticized by actual trucker media like Truck News for exaggerating or even faking some of the danger. Man, it is cracking. It's something fierce. I can't go any slower. Oh my gosh! But real scandal hit the show in 2013. According to a CBS report, star Tim Zicker abducted Lisa Cadeau after hiring her for escort work in Las Vegas. He claimed she overcharged him by $1,000 and demanded she meet him to settle the dispute. 
It was then that he dragged her back to his apartment, beat her, and tied her up in a closet. Fearing for her life, Cadeau gave Zicker the phone number of an undercover police officer, claiming he could pay her ransom. Zicker called the number and unknowingly arranged his own arrest. The Las Vegas Sun reported Zicker confessed on the spot that he intended to hold Cadeau hostage and prostitute her through Craigslist. Every so often, even the History Channel has to admit that some of their programming is a tad controversial. Like the time they commissioned and then abruptly canceled a $30 million miniseries about the Kennedys, The Hollywood Reporter explained that an early leaked draft of the script caused an outcry among Kennedy family allies. And after months of rewrites and filming, the high-profile project was pulled entirely for being pretty much wall-to-wall -wall slander and lies. Either they made it sound like I like Hitler, said I was anti-American, me! Co-creator Joel Cerno defended his project via The Atlantic, claiming people were biased against him for being a staunch conservative making a series about the Kennedys. Conspiracy theorists also took the opportunity to insist that the surviving members of the Kennedy family had bullied the History Channel into dropping the show. But when the miniseries eventually did come out elsewhere, The Hollywood Reporter review called it, quote, dull, unwatchable, and a ham-fisted mess. Swamp People follows the lives of alligator hunters living in Louisiana, but alligators actually seem to be the least of the cast's worries. According to TMZ, Swamp People stars R.J. Moliner and J. Paul Moliner were arrested for attacking a man with a beer bottle. TMZ also reported that Trapper Joe was arrested for burning his girlfriend with a lit cigarette and then punching her in the chest. And Screen Rant detailed the time that Roger Rivers Jr. got in trouble with the law for selling illegal meat. We like it all. We eat everything down here. <laughs> The Swamp People of the show proved so troublesome, Starcasm reports that most of the cast was suddenly fired before season 7 of the show, shocking fans and sending angry cast members into social media ranks. Producers held firm, though, and remaining fans just had to deal with a whole new bunch of Swamp People. Bigfoot Captured was a feature-length special about the discovery and capture of a real Sasquatch. It was also, as Paste Magazine put it, a TV abomination. History Channel styled the show as a real documentary, despite the fact that the program was pure fiction. But not everyone recognized it as fake, leaving some viewers furious about pseudoscience being presented as fact, and others excited to discover proof of a real Bigfoot. At this point, I think Bigfoot's going to become uh, a lot closer to reality. Not only did the channel fool their audience, they also more or less lied to their guest experts about the nature of the production. Professor Jeff Meldrum said, via the Idaho State Journal, that he was disappointed that the documentary faked evidence and had no interest in working from credible information. His suggestion for viewers? Take what you can from it and have a chuckle over the remainder. According to Variety, the show Hunting Hitler upset plenty of people by trivializing Hitler and giving credence to conspiracy theories about his escape to Argentina. If this were really a picture of Hitler, it would change history. But even more upsetting is the fact that the History Channel promised anonymity to one of their key sources, and then clearly broadcast his entire face to more than 180 countries. The team arrives at a private home where the informant, along with his translator Philippe, has arranged to meet them under the condition that his identity be protected. As the New York Daily News reports, the grandson of a Nazi war criminal agreed to appear on the program with the understanding that his face would not be shown. Production did blur his face out, except for one shot where it is clearly visible. An obvious disaster for someone who doesn't want to broadcast that his grandfather was a Nazi. Remember when the History Channel solved the mystery of Amelia Earhart, only to have their key piece of evidence immediately debunked by a blogger? When you hear the name Amelia Earhart, it's a question mark that's never been solved. According to Vanity Fair, the documentary Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence caused some short-lived excitement when it presented a photo of Earhart and her navigator alive and in the Marshall Islands after her mysterious disappearance. The documentary suggests that Earhart survived her infamous crash in 1937 and that the U.S. government knew she was alive but covered it up. The network enjoyed a brief moment of historical triumph before they were thwarted by a blogger doing minimal research. National Geographic reported that Japanese military blogger Kota Yamano looked up the alleged location of the photo in the Japanese National Library's database and found that the pic was published in a Japanese coffee table book in 1935, two years before Earhart took her flight. So even if it were Amelia Earhart in that photo, which it's not, it proves nothing about her disappearance. American Pickers follows a couple of guys while they travel around the country and sift through piles of other people's junk in the hopes of finding treasure. The show's producers have occasionally been accused of planting the good stuff, and while we can't know that for sure, at least one of the show's two stars has definitely been caught doing less than upstanding stuff. This is a perfect situation for a pick. Back in 2018, Frank Fritz pled guilty to charges of operating while intoxicated, which also included driving the wrong way on the interstate. According to the police reports, Fritz was, quote, weaving about the roadway under the influence of Xanax and alcohol. 
The miniseries The Bible was a huge hit for the network in 2014, except for that one slip-up where the producers cast an actor who looked a whole lot like President Barack Obama to play the devil. As described in The Guardian, the comparison went viral almost immediately after the 10-hour miniseries first premiered. You couldn't throw a stone emoji without hitting several hundred posts of Obama's face next to Moroccan actor Mohamed Ozani. Producer Roma Downey claimed the resemblance was a total coincidence, but the damage was already done. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you the whole world. Time reported that when the Bible producers cut down the series for the feature-length film version Son of God, they decided to nick Satan entirely, hoping audiences would focus their attention on Jesus instead. The reality competition alone tries to one-up Survivor by abandoning its contestants in the middle of nowhere and then following their journey to survive alone in the wilderness. Happily, none of these people are naked, because another truly awful reality show already did that. I'm bored. The really stupid thing about all of this is that no matter how alone the series makes it look like these people are, of course they're not really alone. What about all the camera people who are literally everywhere, right? One thing that's very interesting about how the show was shot is that it, it's all self-documented. We may never know the truth on that, but according to eCelebrity, contestants are not being forced to survive miles from civilization, which is what the showrunners want you to believe. Instead, in many cases, the contestants are actually within an hour's walk to the nearest town, and sometimes they're in a place where there is a network of trails, which definitely seems to suggest that they're not really that isolated. History's Mountain Men features people pretending like they are living in the 17th century, except for when they watch TV while no one is looking. To me, there's way too much overdevelopment in this world, and I, I want to do at least my part in keeping some of it wild. One of the stars of the show is Eustace Conway, and his deal is teaching people how to be self-sufficient and also how to be super pretentious about their self-sufficiency. His bio reads, like Thoreau, Eustace has gone to the woods to live deliberately, fronting only the essential facts of life, to see if he could not learn what it had to teach, and not when he came to die, discovered that he had not lived. Yeah, he's that kind of guy. But when he's not being pretentious on mountain men, he's being pretentious on his 1,000-acre wildlife preserve in North Carolina, where he teaches people how to live in the wilderness for a mere $700 a week, or $65 an hour if you'd rather just spend an afternoon riding around in a horse-drawn carriage. According to the Wall Street Journal, the preserve was recently raided by health, construction, and fire officials, who deemed many of Conway's buildings, quote, not fit for public use. When you think of lumberjacks, you usually think of burly dudes in plaid chopping down trees, putting wipe your butt on a spotted owl stickers on their trucks, and maybe pressing wildflowers like in that Monty Python song. You don't typically think of them pulling stuff out of the water, because that's not where trees usually are. According to NPR, though, there was a time when lumberjacks used to float log rafts made of felled trees down the river for transport. Every now and then, the trees would fall off the raft and sink to the bottom, and they don't rot down there either. If the water is cold, the trees will stay preserved at the bottom for a long time and can eventually be salvaged. The problem is, salvaging sunken trees is not legal in the state of Washington. But that didn't stop the late Axeman star Jimmy Smith from fishing those logs out of the river on national television, which was either ridiculously arrogant or ridiculously stupid. I'm the first one in the Northwest to do this type of logging. Smith had an entirely altruistic reason for his actions, though, to protect people participating in water sports on the river. He said, If I can save one kid or one boater, I think it's worth it. And we're sure that the money he got for those logs didn't factor into it at all. The wildly popular Pawn Stars features the supposedly real day-to-day -day activities of the world-famous Gold and Silver Pawn Shop in Las Vegas. But the show has been widely criticized for having a rather loose definition of reality, and the shop itself has previously gotten into trouble over some of its merchandise. According to ABC News, they may have once melted down $50,000 worth of stolen coins. But the most valuable treasures at the Gold and Silver Pawn Shop, apparently, are the stars themselves. HuffPost reported in 2012 that the former talent agents of the Pawn Stars stars were suing their ex-clients for switching agencies, demanding $5 million in lost commissions. The agency, Venture IAB Inc., claimed that History Channel execs had intentionally seduced the stars away from their original representation, convincing them to hire rival Michael Camacho of UTA as their agent instead and losing Venture millions in commissions. It's unclear what happened with the lawsuit, which likely means it was dismissed or settled out of court. Then there's Pawn Stars fan favorite Austin Lee Russell, better known by his stage name Chumley. He's portrayed as a comic foil at the shop, but in non-televised reality, Chumley's life is somewhat less whimsical. As USA Today reports, police carried out a search of his house while following up on assault allegations in 2016. They didn't find evidence to convict him, but they did find drugs in his regrettably named Chum Chum room, including marijuana and meth, as well as numerous illegal firearms. 
According to the New York Daily News, however, the reality star was able to avoid jail time with a plea deal, despite being charged with several felonies. Ancient Aliens might hold the dubious crown of the History Channel's least historical show. It also made its way onto Southern Poverty Law Center's Hate Watch blog for showcasing white supremacist theories. Is it possible that the course of human civilization has been determined not by history's most profound thinkers, but by some external force. The idea that ancient African, Asian, and Native American architectural marvels could have only been built by some kind of alien entity isn't a new one. Hate Watch reminds us that this concept was used by Andrew Jackson to justify the Indian Removal Act of 1830 in North America. In fact, much white supremacist literature over the years has suggested that non-European civilizations didn't build any wonders of the past, and that ancient Aryans are somehow secretly responsible. Switch out Aryans for aliens, and you can see why some people find the show so distasteful. And as Hyperallergic points out, we already know how the pyramids were built. Ramps. When it comes to the Curse of Oak Island, there exists a piece of so-called evidence that we know is fake, the Oak Island map. This particular map looks like it got torn out of a journal someone purchased at the Dollar Tree, but the notes are in French. According to the show, this map is connected to a much more mysterious and valuable Templar document. Zena's map and her research I find incredible. I want to prove that it's authentic. And to that end, I think we've made some strides. But according to Donald Rue, who was once in possession of both of those documents, the two are unrelated. He also says that the Oak Island map is a fabrication, created by someone in the 70s. If the show's use of those two pieces of evidence is what amounts to proof, we don't really believe anything else on Oak Island. The fact that Counting Car star Danny Coker is living a hippie-hating, muscle-car-loving, masculine stereotype isn't surprising. He's a car guy, and he likes combustion engines, loud noises, and high speed. And really none of those things are compatible with a cleaner environment. Guys, I'm just not feeling this. He told the Canadian Morning Show in 2013, Prius, I've got no use for it. If it gets four miles to the gallon and has 800 horsepower, I'm thrilled. We've got more oil than we can shake a stick at. The politicians are playing a game. Let's burn this stuff and have a good time. According to The Vegas Tourist, Rick Dale from American Restoration was called out in 2012 for restoring a 1950s styles jukebox but failing to actually repair the thing for the original agreement. Now, it's great to have a sharp-looking jukebox, but what you really want is a sharp-looking jukebox that plays music, especially if you paid someone $4,000 to do it. But not only did Dale reportedly fail to acknowledge that the work wasn't complete, he also cashed the check and stopped returning his customers' phone calls. It's not all about the money. It's about making something that you want your memory alive. Sons of Liberty is what American history would look like if the Founding Fathers were all moonlighting as characters on Riverdale. Actual history recalls the Sam Adams of 1765 as a middle-aged dude with a paunch, but in Sons of Liberty, he's hot. And that's not the show's only inaccuracy. The Journal of the American Revolution listed 22 missteps within the first episode alone. This is yet another incident in a long line of treasonable acts committed by a childish and insubordinate colony. Of course, this is historical fiction, and almost every piece of historical fiction ever written contains inaccuracies. It's called creative license. Just don't believe everything you see on history. That that freedom cannot be taken away from us. That, that is our God-given right. In history's defense, Vikings is based on the Old Norse sagas, which National Geographic reports were written down in the 13th century but were passed down verbally for centuries prior. So the facts recorded in the sagas have likely been embellished, altered, or even completely made up. Historians don't even agree on whether the show's central character, Ragnar Lothbrok, even existed. Who wants to be king? One of the biggest liberties showrunners took was with the relationship between Ragnar and Rollo. In real life, assuming Ragnar existed, the two men were not only not brothers, it's unlikely they ever even met. And the show's timeline is suspect too, as we see our favorite marauders raiding a monastery in season one and then attacking Paris in season three, two events that happened 120 years apart, according to Ranker. Also, the Vikings did wear helmets, though not horned ones. Christians didn't crucify heathens, and Vikings almost never fought pitched battles since they preferred raids. Sadly, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the truth. It's one of the world's most ridiculous conspiracy theories. The government is filling the air with chemicals so they can control the weather. Most people understand that this idea is ridiculous, because if it was actually true that the government was filling the air with chemicals in a bid to alter the weather patterns of the United States and beyond, they appear to be really, really bad at it. Most people think the idea is dumb, except History Channel, who evidently felt like it was worth discussing in an episode of That's Impossible called Weather Warfare. The special basically just repeated the whole conspiracy theory and provided a platform to the paranoid people who actually believe it. 
which is not a great thing to do in an era when half the population already doesn't trust science. Reality television is part exploitation, part making fun of people who deserve it, and part totally, utterly, and completely fake. But there are lines that even reality television producers try not to cross, and the producers of American Jungle definitely crossed one or two of them. The 2013 show American Jungle was short-lived, so you might not even remember it. It was presented as a show about native Hawaiians from rival groups fighting each other over hunting territory. The Hawaiian government was certainly not amused, claiming the show portrayed the participants in a culturally insensitive way, as well as portraying Hawaii's history inaccurately. According to officials in Hawaii, the show depicted illegal activities too, such as hunting at night and hunting feral cow without a permit. We're not sure how much any of this had to do with the show's swift cancellation, but it didn't get past its first eight episodes. Shows about hidden treasure and unsolved historical mysteries tend to do well for history, but as anyone who was inspired by Indiana Jones can tell you, real treasure hunting is super boring. A neat collection, George Washington's campaign buttons. You're missing the uh, 1789 inaugural, though. I found one once. That's very fortunate for you. So to get people to actually tune into a show about treasure, you kind of need to sensationalize, embellish, and just make things up as you go along. With that in mind, the accuracy of most treasure hunting shows is questionable at best. The history show Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar was a short-lived series starring forensic geologist Scott Walter and treasure hunter Barry Clifford. Their team was searching sunken wrecks off the coast of Madagascar that they believed were connected to the Portuguese Templars. The show was called out for unprofessionalism by UNESCO, which accused them of treating the research and recovery of the vessels recklessly, without proper precautions and actually damaging the sites. In response, Walter claimed that UNESCO had a personal vendetta, writing on his blog, UNESCO hates Barry Clifford simply because he is the most successful pirate ship discoverer in history. Oh, okay, that must be it. Joseph Frontiera had a comfy little stint as a reality TV star slash background character on the history series Counting Cars, but then he blew it. Or at least that's what a lawsuit filed against him by his former employers at Counts Customs says. Frontiera was accused of embezzling around $75,000 from the shop and using the money to buy plane tickets and make a down payment on a Range Rover. How did he do this? His accusers think he made rubber stamp copies of the company boss's signatures, so the company's checking account could become his own personal checking account. The scandal was big news for a while, but the case was closed in April 2019, obviously finding in favor of Counts Customs. At a certain point, one has to wonder when the History Channel is going to change their name, because they certainly don't seem to be heading down a trajectory of finding more historically accurate subjects to talk about. One of history's semi-recent shows is a scripted drama called Project Blue Book, which is another show about aliens, although this one actually had a lot of factually correct stuff in it. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, for example, was a real person who worked as a scientific consultant for a government program called Project Blue Book, which collected 12,000 plus accounts of unidentified flying objects. The problem with the series is that it doesn't just stick to the real story, and it's not because the real story is super boring either. It's because it's just not exciting enough for big ratings. So history dumped a whole bunch of made-up stuff into the mix and gave it a stir, so there's just enough untruth that viewers have no idea what's real and what's fake. You know, as any good History Channel should do. Who doesn't love a good Kennedy assassination conspiracy theory? Most people, actually, but that didn't stop history from airing an older docuseries called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, with additional episodes created for the 40th anniversary airing in 2003. The only people who really paid attention to the series were the relatives of Lyndon B. Johnson, because an episode called The Guilty Men implied that it was Johnson himself who plotted to kill Kennedy so he could become president himself. Johnson's family wanted to be able to rebut the episode, and History Channel tried to appease them by saying they'd hired experts to review the new episode that they had based on the book Blood, Money, and Power, How LBJ Killed JFK. And then, if they found more inaccuracies, they promised to air another program that would publicly debunk the theory. Who's at risk? Who's going to gain the most? Who wins in this deal? There's only one answer to that question, and that's Lyndon Johnson. Well, their experts must have found something implausible in the episode because history did issue an apology during a one-hour special entitled The Guilty Men, A Historical Review, which concluded that the original episode should have never been broadcast. No, it's wrong. It's corrupt, it's dishonest, it's deceitful, and which oh, this film is in its entirety. History's The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch was supposed to be a level-headed scientific analysis of the weird things that happen on the infamous Sherman Ranch in Utah. But when you really sit down and watch the show, you begin to suspect that maybe the team is just using science to try and back up what they already think they know is happening. Look at that. It looks like an object above the tree. And it happens right when the cow moves, raises up. There's even an astrophysicist on the program, but even his theories seem to lean more religious than scientific. By episode two, viewers were already hate-tweeting and abandoning the show in droves, with one disappointed viewer writing, 
One investigation is just a bunch of dudes playing with high-tech toys. The Knights Templar had a cool name. They were mysterious, they were powerful, and they probably looked awesome in chainmail. The Knights were originally supposed to protect pilgrims crossing into the Holy Land, but they ended up being much more than just bodyguards. They also acquired the blessing of the Pope, who exempted them from taxes and other rules that applied to non-Templars, so they eventually became unusually rich. So rich that they set up a bunch of banks so pilgrims could withdraw money once they were in the Holy Land and not have to worry about getting robbed en route. Yes, the Knights were bankers. Not so according to history's Nightfall, though. In Nightfall, the Knights Templar are an elite fighting force, have a lot of affairs, and get sweaty, but somehow still manage to stay Hollywood attractive under all the blood. The show kind of has to embellish the Knights because they probably weren't really an elite fighting force so much as a powerful financial institution, and King Philip IV of France probably took them down because he owed them money. You might get a few guys on Wall Street to tune in for that version of the show, but history's viewers may actually prefer the fiction in this case. Somehow, the title The Men Who Built America made it past history's team of whoever it is that stops terrible titles from happening. As it turns out, The Men Who Built America celebrates the accomplishments of a bunch of really rich dudes, but it also just ignores millions of workers who actually got their hands dirty, and perhaps even more tellingly, downplays or even villainizes the contributions of the people who toiled to bring these visionary heroes' visions to life. One episode in the miniseries depicts the Homestead Steel Strike, but even though the show is a documentary, it gets a lot of the facts completely wrong implying that there was something sinister about the strike and the workers who plotted against poor, wealthy Andrew Carnegie. And so it goes on, asking viewers to venerate all those wealthy men because they built some cars and bridges and loaned a lot of money to people. History doesn't exactly shy away from the morbid or tasteless, so it should have surprised no one when they publicly announced they'd be making a documentary that would end spectacularly with the exhumation of a corpse. John Dillinger was a gangster who gained infamy in the 1930s for robbing banks and also being handsome. The end of Dillinger's story is that he was taken down by the FBI and then buried under three feet of concrete. And ever since, there are people who say it wasn't really John Dillinger who got shot by the FBI that night. This rumor has persisted for so long that Dillinger's relatives decided to have him exhumed in order to finally answer the question, and history decided that it should be on video. As it turns out, though, it's not actually that easy to get permission to dig up a corpse, and Dillinger's family had to abandon the idea after a judge dismissed their case against the cemetery, which had denied permission for the exhumation. Before that decision, though, history decided to back out of the project. They didn't say why, but it might have had something to do with the fact that digging up corpses is morbid and morally bankrupt. Then again, that hasn't stopped history before.